Hi, I'm Dory Lerner, K-12 educator from the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm so happy to share this really special Small But Mighty story time with you. Today we're going to be um, remembering the Birmingham Children's Marches or Birmingham Children's Crusade of 1963. Um, this happened uh, during a time when it was really difficult for the adults in the community to stand up against segregation. Um, segregation is a time when people were kept separate based on the color of their skin. This is an object that I often share with students and give them the chance to hold and feel. Um, this object is um, it's a very sad object because it reminds us of a time when people were segregated or kept separate. And this would have hung in probably like a train station. Um, and it is uh, made of metal, so it's really, really heavy. But uh, it's very sad, right? So sometimes we look at objects that are sad and, and remind us of a sad time in history. And the story we're going to read today reminds us of this difficult time in history, but it also reminds us of young people's ability to stand up and change segregation. So during this time when it was really difficult for adults to stand up and fight, the children were brave and courageous and stood up and created change. So the book we're going to read today is called The Youngest Marcher, the story of Audrey Faye Hendricks, a young civil rights activist. It was written by Cynthia Levinson and illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton. Also, we want to thank the publishers of this book. The publishers are Athenium Books for Young Readers and Simon and & Schuster. All right. Whenever Mike flew into town, Audrey and her mama cooked barbecued ribs, stewed greens, sweet potato souffle, and Audrey's favorite, hot rolls baptized in butter. Ooh, I can almost smell all those yummy sounding foods. Other folks knew Mike as Martin or Dr. King. The Hendrixes used his nickname. They did the same with other ministers too, like Fred Shuttlesworth and Jim Bevel. After Mike blessed the feast, Mama expected Audrey to keep still during supper. But when grown-ups talked about wiping out segregation, laws that kept black and white people apart in Birmingham, she just had to speak up. Audrey intended to go places and do things like anybody else. I want to eat my ice cream inside Newberries. I want to sit down at the Alabama. I don't want hand-me-down school books. But stools at the counter, plush movie theater seats, books so fresh they'd crackle when you'd open them. Those were for white children. Hush! hissed Mama. Nine-year-old children should not speak in front of company, especially ministers like Mike, Fred, and Jim, who are bringing dreams of justice. Audrey knew all about segregation. She knew to pay the driver at the front of the bus, then step off and walk around to the back door, drink from the fountain with the dirty bowl and warm water, use the freight elevator at department stores downtown, front row seats, Cool water, elevators with white gloved operators, those laws said those were for white folks. Every Monday night, Audrey and her mama and daddy and her aunts and uncles and cousins joined neighbors and friends at Fred's church for worship, fellowship, and testimony. She sang and swayed along with the movement choir, her voice spirited and spiritual, black and white together, we shall overcome. For once, she didn't have to keep still. Audrey just knew Mike's plan would work. She twisted around in her pew to see which grown-ups would walk down the aisle and volunteer for jail, but they mostly stayed put, eyes staring at their feet, hands on their knees. Feet, hands, and knees didn't move. Fill the jails, Mike pleaded, meeting after meeting, but heads shook. All around her, Audrey heard, no, best not break those segregation laws. Boss man will fire me. Landlord will evict me. Policeman will beat me. If nobody protested, Mike's plan would fail. Police could keep arresting anyone, anytime, for anything, forever. Audrey would never be able to go places and do things like everybody else. One night, Jim announced a new idea. If grown-ups won't do it, fill the jails with children. Audrey leapt to her feet. I want to go to jail, she declared. Mama looked deep and saw that Audrey's eyes begged, please. Audrey strutted down that aisle. 
Okay, Mama said. She was going to jail. Two mornings later, she put on a fresh pressed pinafore and shiny Mary Janes with turned down socks. Protesters got to look nice. In the meantime, her daddy bought her a game to help her pass the time in jail. Her mama and daddy took her by Center Street Elementary to tell her teacher she'd be absent, maybe for a whole week. Miss Wills wrapped her arms around her. Audrey knew she was proud of her. She said goodbye to her grandparents. You'll be fine, said her grandmother. She knew Audrey would be brave, and so did Audrey. Then her mama and daddy drove her to 16th Street Baptist Church, where the children were gathering. Even before she reached the doors, Audrey heard loud voices chanting freedom songs. Inside, hundreds of big kids called out to friends and crowded around signs for their high schools. Parker, Carver, her head swiveled. Where was the sign for Center Street Elementary? She was the only protester from her school, the youngest child in the whole church, and she knew no one. Audrey huddled by her parents in the basement. There she is. She looks a little bit scared, doesn't she? Look at all these kids, though, with their signs. When Jim, But when Jim lined her up with the others, two by two, and the door swung open, Audrey straightened up. She was going to break a law and go to jail to help make things right. Clutching a protest sign in one hand and her game in the other, Audrey marched out the door, and she stomped and sang, Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Half a block from the church, a white policeman stopped Audrey. He pointed toward the van. Sentence, one week in juvenile hall. A matron locked Audrey into a day room with two dozen other girls, all older, all bigger, all strangers. Audrey sat down all alone and slipped the cover off her game. I told you to sit down, the matron yelled. Audrey jumped. She didn't remember standing up. The matron dragged her to a dark, empty room. When I tell you to do something, you do it, she commanded, or I'll leave you here. Trembling, Audrey quietly followed the matron back to the day room, put away her game, lay down her head, and cried. Jail was harder than she thought, and she wasn't fine after all. By evening, Audrey was hungry and tired. For dinner, soupy, oily, tasteless grits. At night, a bare mattress with one thin sheet for a cover. The next morning, uh-oh, no fresh underwear, no clean pinafore, and no toothbrush. Audrey and her cellmates were led outdoors into an empty concrete pen surrounded by high prison walls. The older girls talked together. Audrey wondered what her classmates were doing. Miss Wills would be keeping them busy. On another day, Audrey was sent into a huge room and told to sit in a chair that was so high her feet dangled above the floor. Four white men glared at her. She'd never talked to a white man before. Are you against America? One demanded to know. No, sir, she answered politely. What do you talk about at those meetings? Another asked. Our freedom. Why do you march? To go places and do things like anybody else. What was wrong with that? Every mealtime, Audrey stared at greasy grits. She could barely spoon them into her mouth, let alone swallow them. Every night, the cot's wire springs jabbed. Every morning, she had nothing to do but sit alone with her game. In the afternoons, though, more kids crowded into the day room. Some days, many of them arrived sopping wet. A girl explained that firemen had aimed powerful water hoses at the children, Surging water spun them off their feet and down the street. They got up and kept marching anyway until they too were sent to jail. By Audrey's fifth day in detention, the police couldn't squeeze in one more person. 
We filled up all the rooms. We filled up all the rooms. Audrey practically jumped up and down. She was so proud, and that's what she said. We filled up all the rooms. Watching television in the day room, she saw black people stroll straight into stores and restaurants like they belonged there. No one else could be sent to jail. Everything had changed. After seven days, Audrey went home. Her mama and daddy wrapped their arms tight around her and washed the jail off her. And for dinner, hot rolls baptized in butter. Two months later, the city of Birmingham wiped segregation laws clean off the books. Audrey licked her spoon clean at Newberry's counter like everybody else. See? Black and white together like we belong. So everyone, that's the end of the story. But afterwards, there is um, an author's note and it talks a little about Audrey Faye Hendricks and also how um, young people were change makers during this um, really important time in civil rights history, the Birmingham Children's Crusade. There's a timeline of the Birmingham Children's Marches. And also, this is really cool, I thought maybe for our activity today, you all could try this recipe. This is a recipe for hot rolls baptized in butter. So everybody, it says it makes about 25 to 30 rolls. Now be sure that a grown-up helps you when you make these and um, share them when you, with your family as well. Everybody, we want to thank you so much for joining us for this really special story time today where all um, the young people that were in this story, and especially Audrey Faye Hendricks, stood up together and created change. And we want to thank you guys for being young change makers. So now... We want you to think of a time where you might go out and stand up for change. So we have a picture of some young activists here who stood up in a Black Lives Matter march. And that was a really important time for them. So they made protest signs and they stood up and marched. You don't have to necessarily march to be an activist and you don't have to be a grown up to be an activist. An activist is somebody who sees injustice and takes action. So I want you to think about ways that you can stand up in your community each and every day. Even though our communities are really kind of staying at home right now and we're being um, kind of away from the public so that we're staying safe, I want you to think about ways that you can stand up and create change and make the world a better place. Thanks so much for joining me today for this Small But Mighty Storytime, and I hope you'll find ways to go out and be an activist.